Welcome to this presentation on how to achieve representative samples. Knowing about how to achieve representative samples is extremely important when you're trying to analyze whether an inductive argument is relatively strong or weak. In evaluating an inductive argument, the strength of an inductive argument relies on a concept called sample representativeness. Sample representativeness is achieved by ensuring that your sample has adequate and appropriate diversity and that you have an adequate sample size. These concepts are particularly important when you're dealing with generalizations. If the inductive argument fails to have a representative sample, then the argument is relatively weak. We need to briefly review that an inductive generalization does not allow us to look at the entire population that we are talking about in the conclusion. It would be nice if we could investigate everyone or every item in the target population. However, this is generally impossible to do, particularly when you have large populations that you're trying to work with, such as the people of a state or the people of an entire country. There's no way that you could interview, for example, every single person in the entire country to find out whether they prefer Coke or Pepsi. So, it's impossible for us to look at everyone. Thus, we need to choose a subset of the population. The subset of the population that we actually investigate is called our sample. Now that we've had this quick reminder on what a sample is, let's take a look at the various characteristics that need to be achieved in order to have a representative sample. Sample representativeness is simply the extent to which a sample contains all the relevant features or variation that we expect to see in the target population. For example, if we expect to see a large number of women in the target population, then we need to have a large number of women in the sample. Or if we expect to see a large number of book readers in the target population, and what we're investigating is relevant to book reading, then we would need to have a large number of book readers in the sample population as well. Sample representativeness might be more difficult to achieve in some situations than in others. In order to determine whether sample representativeness is difficult to achieve, we need to think about our target population. Some target populations have more variety than others. The more varied your target population, the more difficult it might be to achieve sample representativeness. Heterogeneous target populations have targets with lots of diversity or variety. And in these cases, sample representativeness is important and might be a little bit more difficult to achieve. However, some targets do not have any expected variety with respect to the property or the attribute in question. We call these homogeneous target populations. When we're dealing with a homogeneous target population, sample representativeness is not difficult to achieve. Let's take a look at some examples at heterogeneous target populations and homogeneous target populations. Here we have on the left a list of some examples of heterogeneous target populations. Animals are heterogeneous. Why? Well, the class or the population of animals contains lots of diversity. There are many different species of animals that come in all different shapes and sizes, live in different habitats, have different behaviors, different priorities, likes and dislikes. And so I could not simply choose a cow, for example, to try to represent all animals. I would need to choose a sample that contains lots of diversity if my population is all animals. Automobiles is another heterogeneous 
target population. Not all automobiles are race cars. We know that there are many different makes, models, and ages of automobiles. So I wouldn't be able to choose just one race car to represent the entire class of automobiles. Likewise, people are a very diversified target population. There are different genders, ethnicities, opinions, preferences, nationalities, and so it would be difficult to choose just one or two or three people to try to represent the diversity that exists among all human beings. Similarly, plant life is a heterogeneous target population. I could not choose just one pine tree to try to represent all plants. Now let's take a look at some examples of homogeneous target populations. The taste of the wine in the wine glass counts as a homogeneous target population. Why? Well, I do not expect the wine in the wine glass to vary from the top to the bottom, for example. What this means is that I could probably take just one or two sips of the wine from the wine glass to figure out whether I like the taste of the wine in that glass. I do not expect the wine at the top of the, the glass to taste much different from the wine at the bottom of the glass. So we would say we do not expect diversity or variation with respect to the taste of the wine in the glass and we would count it as a homogeneous target population. Similarly, the quality of the milk in this carton. If I open the carton of milk and take a sip and realize that it is spoiled, it's a safe bet that all the milk in the carton is spoiled. I would not expect the milk at only the top to be spoiled and at the bottom to be just great. So we would consider the spoilage of the milk in the carton to be a homogeneous population. With homogeneous target populations, you can get away with very small sample sizes. How do we achieve sample representativeness? When we know we're dealing with a heterogeneous target population, or a population with variation, we should try to use large sample sizes. It's hoped that the more members we include in the sample, the more diversity or variation we can expect to see in that sample. For example, let's say you're trying to figure out what types of music are popular among the students at your school. Could you ask just Bob in order to answer this question adequately? Probably not. Bob might have musical taste that is very different from the average population. We know that musical tastes will vary among the students, and so we would need to include more in our sample than just Bob. So, the more members of our sample, the more variation we expect to see in our sample, and the better picture we'll get of the musical tastes among our target population. Another way that we can try to achieve sample representativeness is to randomly select the members of the sample. There's a very clear definition of random selection. Every member of the target population has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. You actually engage in random selection when you do things like draw names out of a hat or draw straws. In this case, every person has basically the same chance as every other person of being selected for your sample. However, in some instances, it might be difficult to randomly select. You may not have enough time to randomly select, or for other practical reasons, it might simply be impossible. Although random selection is often considered the most reliable way to choose a sample, we can also use something called 
quota sampling to attempt to achieve sample representativeness. Let's take, for example, the people working at your business. You know that you could probably divide the people working at your business according to racial identification. Let's say at your particular business, you know that there are Caucasians, African Americans, and Hispanic Americans. Let's say that you have one-third Caucasians, one-third African Americans, and one-third Hispanic Americans working at your business. In that case, you could divide into those subgroups, or strata, and then select your sample from those strata. Your selected subsamples, then, would be sure to include one-third Caucasian, one-third African-American, and one-third Hispanic-American individuals. Hopefully through this quota sampling, you can achieve sample representativeness, at least with respect to racial identification. However, quota sampling has its drawbacks. Notice in this particular example, I didn't think about the ratio of men to women. That might be important. I also didn't think about things like uh, social or class identification. I might have a lot of people who make under $50,000 and very few people who make over $50,000 working at my business. But I didn't seem to take that into account in my quota sampling. So when quota sampling, you have to try to think of all the different relevant characteristics and identifications, meaning all the relevant groups that exist in your target population, and try to account for those as you're co coming up with your quotas. Quota sampling is difficult, but in certain instances, it's the only method that we can use to select a sample. Now let's discuss some fallacies of inductive arguments. Bias occurs when there's a failure to achieve sample representativeness. In other words, when the sample fails to include all of the relevant variation that we expect to see in the target population, we know then that our sample is not the good basis of an inductive argument. This is less likely to occur with homogeneous target populations because we're not worried about the variety in a homogeneous target population. If we're not worried about variety in the population, then we're not going to be concerned with creating variety in our sample group either. Bias frequently results from sampling error. In other words, a problem with the method of selecting the members of the sample. For example, in quota sampling, we might neglect to understand that there's some important variation or characteristic in our target population, and so we might not represent it adequately in our sample population. Other forms of sampling error occur from the method that we use to select the members of the sample. For example, Let's say we are conducting a telephone survey. We are trying to determine whether Americans are in favor or against some sort of change to government assistance systems. If we use the telephone to try to contact the members of the sample, we are then failing to represent people who do not have telephones. This would include all those who are currently incarcerated, and the homeless. Of course, if we're trying to figure out whether Americans are in favor or against some sort of change to government assistance programs, the opinions of those who are incarcerated and the opinions of the homeless might matter very much, since they are directly affected. However, we fail to include them in our sample when we only use telephones to try to contact members of our sample. Thus, we are underrepresenting an important group in our target population.
and there is some bias then in our argument. The last fallacy that we need to worry about in this presentation is hastiness. A generalization suffers from hastiness when the sample size is too small. Why are we worried about small sample sizes? Well, remember that the larger the sample, or the more members we include in the sample, the more variation we expect to see in that sample. So a small sample size might mean that we have failed to include important relevant variation. In other words, smaller sample sizes fail to achieve the representativeness that is required for heterogeneous target populations. As long as our sample is randomly selected, a sample size of 1,000 is generally adequate to represent a population of 1 million or more. For more on this concept, be sure to read the, the appropriate portion of your textbook. For target populations that are under 1 million, you can generally get away with having a sample size that is the square root of the size of your target population. Remember that hastiness is less likely to be a problem with a homogeneous target population simply because with homogeneous target populations we're not worried about trying to include a lot of variation. Good luck with these concepts and good luck on the lesson associated with this tutorial.